to introduce our speakers for today's um, Smilo Cancer Hospital and Yale, Yale Cancer Center Grand Rounds, hosted by the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Yale Cancer Center. And um, I'd like to start by introducing Dr. Obedin Maliver, um, who uses the pronouns she, her, hers. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Stanford University School of Medicine. She spe specializes in gynecologic and reproductive health care of needs of sexual and gender minority people, which include but are not limited to lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and questioning people. This interest and experience drives her research interest towards promoting the health and well being and equity of LG LGBTQ people. She is the director or co director of the Pride Study, a multi site online prospective longitudinal cohort of sexual and gender minority individuals based at Stanford. She is also an incredible advocate in this space and has been very active in health policy. Dr. Ash Alpert, who uses the pronouns they, them, is a current T32 fellow in health equity at the Center for Gerontology and Healthcare Research at Brown University at the um, School of Public Health. Dr. Alpert's research investigates community solutions to improving the experiences and outcomes of transgender people with cancer. They work with an advisory board of transgender people who've been diagnosed with cancer and whom have, uh, they have conducted research, published manuscripts, and applied for grant funding over the last two years. This includes a Young Investigator Award from Conquer Cancer, the ASCO Foundation to develop patient-centered and non-stigmatizing gender identity data collection methods. Dr. Alpert is also very involved with advocacy efforts that includes the ASCO Sexual and Gender Minority Task Force and the MCCN. So it is our great pleasure to hear from both of them today. I will pass the baton. Um, they will be presenting on advancing transgender and gender diverse visibility and inclusion and data accuracy in oncology. Thank you. Um, and thank you so much for this kind um, welcome and introduction. We're both very honored to be here. Thank you, Dr. Coons, as well as all of the attendees, also to Renee and uh, other folks who have helped um, with the logistics. It, it, it often takes an army to, to make these things happen. So thank you so much. Um, and um, overall, we'll be focusing today on specific mechanisms for improving visibility and inclusion of transgender people in oncology and thereby ensuring that our data and clinical decision making are accurate and efficacious. I should say I'm Juno <laughs> uh, Obedin Mellover and everyone just calls me Juno and I'll let Dr. Albert uh, introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Dr. Ash Albert. <laughs> so um, we're gonna talk uh, for a moment about what brings us to this work. Um, we'll then review some of the epidemiology of transgender and gender diverse populations, some linguistics and terminology as well, and then move into how this all relates to cancer, um, and specifically describing uh, the experiences of transgender and gender diverse people with and without cancer in healthcare contexts, all towards proposing a new model of how we think about bodies and how we think about uh, the care that we're providing. Um, and moving away from oversimplified notions of sex or sex assigned at birth um, and being more broad and expansive to really take care of whole person health. Um, and this will turn, you know, finish with uh, a discussion of how the Yale Cancer Center could improve visibility, accuracy, and inclusion, some steps that you can take today, um, and then of course, longer range uh, goals and activities. Um, our slides will be available to you. So there's a lot of um, references and action steps as well. Um, don't worry about trying to capture all of those. Um, and uh, we'll move to the next slide. Um, we are also so very grateful to the following folks who um, have worked with us in, in various capacities um, and whose um, insights and wisdom are shared here, uh, specifically the Transgender um, Cancer Patient Advisory Board that Dr. Albert works very closely with. Um, next slide. Um, so we have no relevant uh, financial disclosures to this presentation, but have been supported by some of the following grants and activities. Uh, they don't present any conflict here. And our job here really is to give you some of a foundational understanding of how 
invisibility, inaccuracy, and exclusion among transgender and gender diverse people plays out in oncology and thereby foster future action and learning towards visibility, accuracy, and inclusion, and ultimately towards health equity. Um, and so to do that, we really see these three objectives describing the exclusion of transgender and gender diverse people and um, sensitize you to some of the health sequelae that uh, follow on from that exclusion, uh, describe uh, some conceptual frameworks that hopefully will be useful to you in your work and um, sensitization to these topics, including linguistic and systemic, um, and support you in addressing health disparities by enhancing visibility and inclusion and then to identifying some key steps uh, that can be taken. So we wanted to start here um, by talking about some of the ways transgender people are often invisible in the medical landscape, in our language, in our documents, and the effects that that has on transgender and gender diverse people. So two staggering statistics, next slide. Sorry, Dr. Albert, <laughs> thank you for driving the slides. Um, our, are these two, um, that nearly one half of transgender people will attempt suicide in their lifetimes. Um, it's a really staggering number. It's actually probably much higher um, given the um, poor data collection that we'll talk about <laughs> here in a moment. Um, and that's in comparison to 1.6% of the general population of adults. Um, additionally, one transgender person is murdered every three days. Um, so if these don't sorry, if these statistics don't grab your heart, you know, um, and just bring you into this, um, we wanted to share a little bit more about our stories. So um, and, and we hope that this really starts to um, bring to visibility the interlocking systems of oppression uh, that don't recognize transgender people's ex existence. And I'll start by saying that, you know, I'm a cisgender queer woman. Um, I live and move in LGBTQ spaces and had been for a long time. Um, and working uh, and living in San Francisco, working on LGBT uh, health. And it was in my internship year when I really started to recognize um, how transgender people weren't considered even as part of that bigger umbrella of LGBTQ plus. Um, I was an intern, I was working in the, in, uh, in the ICU and a transgender woman who was very well known to our hospital system came in with complications of her long standing lung disease. Um, shortly after she arrived, um, code processes began uh, as she went into respiratory failure. And as part of those processes, she was undressed. Um, and when she was undressed, it was noted that she had a penis. At that point, all code activities stopped. People lost their composure and critical activities were halted. People actually stepped away from the bed. And there was this long, terrible pause where people lost their professional activities and all the steps that they should have been taking to help save her life. Um, concurrently, her wife was being called urgently and asked if she wanted extreme measures taken um, for her wife. And um, our patient was misgendered saying, you know, whether we should sustain life for, you know, he, she, it, and it was terrible. Um, so at the point of her death, this woman was disrespected um, and invisibilized um, in that, you know, her death wasn't seen as the death of a woman uh, in this setting. Um, and that her, her wife takes that forward into thoughts and memories of um, what happened in the end of her wife's care. So this blatant disrespect and lack of human decency really propelled me to start to think about how I could do better and how we could all do better in medicine. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Albert. Thanks for that um, very beautiful and moving story. So I'm Ash, um, I'm non-binary and I'm here. And I wanted to share a very different story from back before I actually even knew that I wanted to be a doctor. I was in college and about 20 years old and um, I fell in love with somebody who was transgender. And I remember um, sitting at a dining table and listening to her tell the stories about her life. And I had this very strange sense that 
the world that I understood was, was breaking open, was changing. And that everything that I thought that I knew about my gender and the genders of other people that I had taken as a given was in fact not a given. It was a very strange and scary feeling, um, but it was also incredibly freeing. And that, that person that I had fallen in love with was also very interested in issues of social justice. And it really felt like um, in that moment that I was seeing the possibility of, of revolution and transformation. Later, when I was in medical school, I started doing qualitative research um, with LGBTQ plus people and I noticed a similar feeling that the stories of transgender people in particular had in them the possibility of revealing the assumptions of our medical systems and creating the possibility for change. So I'm hoping that what you'll hear today is both the urgency of making changes to our systems to save the lives of transgender people, and also the beautiful possibility that if we change our systems in these ways, that we might also provide more nuanced and efficacious care for all of our patients. And I'll turn it back to Dr. Obed and Oliver to continue. Thank you so much, Dr. Albert, for sharing your perspective and wisdom as always. So from the stories that you've just heard what, what we'll, and what we'll present today, we want you to take away some, some central concepts and themes. One is that systemic oppression, which is experienced daily levels, uh, leads to cancer disparities, as it's an undercurrent of catalyzing other things that we know worsen the incidence, prevalence, and severity of cancer. Um, invisibility, which is ubiquitous in our world. Just look you know, at any magazine, any media, there's certainly more visibility of transgender and gender diverse people, but it pales in comparison to binary assumptions about gender and who people are and how people move in the world. And this actually leads to data inaccuracies for all people, not just trans people, um, and limits our understanding of how um, the world works, frankly. Um, and we hope to demonstrate some of that. And, and more specifically leads to substandard care for transgender and gender diverse people. And then stigma, which can be implicit or explicit, leads to poor experiences and outcomes. And we see that in many different characteristics and domains, but specifically we'll be talking about limited notions of gender here. And we'll see that these three threads run through the rest of our presentation. Next slide. Um, but first, first things first, we have to level set on a little bit of terminology. Likely many of, much of this is familiar to many people on here, but without assumptions, these are some of the terms that we use. Um, LGBT, sometimes LGBTQ+, um, LGBTQIA, those are all meaningful different abbreviations, but broadly speaking, stand for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer questioning. The plus is really speaking to the fact that the, the diversity of communities that are not cisgender and not straight, uh, and or not straight, um, is broad and actually represented than more than just these few letters and um, subpopulations. And so in recognition of that, actually academia has said, um, we needed a bigger term <laughs> to kind of get our arms around the folks who are not cisgender and not straight. Uh, and so this umbrella term sexual and gender minorities or SGM is what's used in academic spaces, though not much really yet uh, or at all by communities. Um, it is used by the NIH and SGM um, people are recognized as a uh, health disparities population for research by the NIH. Transgender, term that we've used a number of times already in this population, someone whose gender um, differs from that commonly associated with their sex assigned at birth. Um, so that's in some ways the opposite of um, this other term cisgender, which again really came from academia, which is someone whose gender is the same as is commonly associated with their sex assigned at birth. So I use that term in reference to myself. I said I'm a cisgender or queer woman. That means I was assigned female sex at birth, have what's commonly associated with typical female reproductive organs. I, I challenge that terminology, but uh, uterus, ovaries, tubes, et cetera, and, um, and I identify as woman today. Um, and then transgender man and woman, it's really important that we always use terminology that affirms people's gender um, and a transgender man or man who is transgender, presumably assigned female sex at birth. 
Um, and non-binary, a person who is not simply a man or a woman may have multiple genders or outside of the non-binary, uh, outside of a binary man, woman identity or girl, boy identity. Um, so these are some um, important terminology. One thing that we'll point out is um, that not everybody who is transgender uses that terminology for themselves. So really important to use the language that people use for themselves and reflect that back to people. And, and similarly, cisgender, a lot of people who we would classify as cisgender don't know that terminology don't use it so there's a difference between when you're working with individual people versus doing research um, policy etc um, next slide um, for accuracy we also need to discuss some foundational concepts um, and central to this is the understanding of sex or sex assigned at birth as distinct from gender. So sex assigned at birth is identification usually made by looking at external genitalia in my field often uh, in at the time of birth, sometimes before birth, right? We're getting more and more information from ultrasound, genetics, et cetera, often by a healthcare provider, sometimes by parents. And that's different from gender, someone's internal sense of themselves as a woman, a man, Another uh, gender, there are many, um, more than one gender. Um, and this also breaks down into gender identity, clothes you wear, uh, sorry, gender identity, which is something only you can know by um, inside your own head, right? You would have to ask someone and they would have to feel comfortable disclosing that to you for you to know their gender identity, you can't know it by looking at them, versus gender expression, which is known, um, or is something that is read in how we move in the world, hair, makeup, clothes, how we cross our legs, vocal intonations, those are all markers of gender expression. And those don't necessarily quote unquote line up in ways that we've taught that they traditionally do. Um, and that's really different than sexual orientation, which is comprised of individuals, um, sexual attraction, identity, behavior. So there's actually many components of sexual orientation as well, um, which may or may not quote a line. So um, some lesbian women do have sex with men. <laughs> um, and that is a distinction between behavior and identity. Um, there are many sexual orientations and people have both a sexual orientation and a gender identity. And we need to think about those as different domains. Okay, and make sure that as clinicians and administrators, but that we are really teaching and distinguishing between sex assigned at birth and gender. They are so commonly conflated in medicine and research. Okay, next slide. So some of you at this point might be wondering, gosh, great, lots of concepts here, but how important is this? How common is this? Why am I listening maybe? Um, and um, wanted to present a little bit of the epidemiology. So we've talked about this bigger umbrella LGBTQ plus and current research um, would uh, say that, you know, actually the most accurate question, answer to the question of how many LGBT people are there or how many transgender people are there is that we don't know because um, most research census, American community surveys, all these others don't ask people systematically their sexual orientation, sex assigned at birth and gender identity for us to really understand who's in our population. However, um, we have some data um, and we think of these as floor statistics, not as a ceiling, um, because not everybody feels comfortable answering uh, questions like from a random digit dialer. So these data, which come from Gallup, show that 7%, actually over 7% of adults in the US today identify as LGBTQ+. Um, that's more than all the children uh, five and under in the United States. Um, including 20% of Generation Z adults. Um, and among that, 1% are transgender. So next slide. Um, and if we look a little bit more closely into the transgender population and epidemiology, we see that overall about 1%, or which translates to at least 1.8 million people. And we do know that there's a difference by age and generation in the numbers here, but there's really good evidence to suggest it's not necessarily that um, population prevalence statistics are changing, but rather there are real differences in terms of comfort with disclosure, changes in um, understanding and representation of various um, gender norms and concepts of gender. Um, we do see that in the youngest generation, one in 50 are identifying as transgender. And we know that that's a lot less than probably who 
is and, and thinks of themselves and or has the experience of being trans. One really important thing is that trans and gender diverse status is not unique to a particular age, race, ethnicity, income bracket, or education level, and many people have multiple identities. Um, so the take home is you are taking care of transgender people, whether you know it or not. And mm -hmm. it really is critical that we all work to make sure that our spaces are welcoming. Um, and with that, I'm gonna pass it to Dr. Albert. So while we have limited data regarding cancer incidence and outcomes for transgender people, many aspects of the lives of transgender people may predispose us to in increase cancer morbidity and mortality. For example, the majority of trans people who were out or perceived as transgender in schools experienced some sort of mistreatment, and one in five drop out as a result. One in five transgender women will be incarcerated in their lifetimes. Um, one out of three transgender people were fired in the last year or experienced some sort of mistreatment at work. One out of three transgender people will experience homelessness. One out of three are living in poverty. One out of two experience sexual assault in our lifetimes. One out of four are unable to access hormone therapy because of lack of insurance coverage. One out of five transgender people will um, participate in the underground economy, including in sex work. And one out of two, um, Black and Latina trans women are living with HIV. One out of two transgender people are currently experiencing mental distress and mental illness. And so you can imagine that the indirect um, and direct effects of some of these things lead to increased cancer, morbidity, and mortality. For example, increased rates of HIV-related malignancies and HPV-related malignancies. Transgender people also have negative experiences of positions. And that likely also leads to barriers to care. So you can imagine that if one in three trans people had negative experiences with physicians in the last year, that it makes sense that a number of transgender people would not present to healthcare for regular preventative care and cancer screening, and also that people may not have um, symptoms evaluated. So if people um, aren't presenting to care, this likely leads to presentations with later stage cancers and worse outcomes. And in fact, Sarah Jackson recently published some data suggesting that that's in fact the case, that transgender people with specific types of cancers present late and have worse outcomes as a result. We frame our research and scholarship within a conceptual model that acknowledges the ways that interactions between oncology clinicians and transgender people with cancer are affected by the structure, culture, and policies of the institutions in which we find ourselves as well as the systems, policies, and social context around us. So because of that, understanding and changing the experiences and outcomes of individual patients will require not just us learning more and changing the ways we interact with people, but also changing the systems and policies around us. For example, guidelines of organizations like ASCO and NCCN impact research, clinical practice, and institutional policies and ultimately the experiences and outcomes of patients. For this reason, Dr. Obed and Maliver and I have been working closely with NCCN and ASCO to change guidelines to be inclusive of transgender people. In other words, to acknowledge transgender people in our language and the ways that we're thinking about guidelines. Similarly, transgender people are also impacted by state and national policies. So for example, this is a map representing Medicaid policies that cover gender-related care such as hormones or surgeries. And so as, although this hasn't been investigated, as far as we know, these policies likely also change people's access to um, cancer screening and, um, and other types of care. So you can imagine that the experiences of transgender people living in, say, Connecticut, um, where uh, Medicaid policies cover gender-related care might be very different than the experiences of transgender people and their primary care doctors and their oncologists living in Texas. And with that, I'll turn it back to Dr. Obed and Malibar to explore this further. Thank you. And so one of the things that we need to ask ourselves as providers um, is how can we signal to transgender and gender diverse people that the spaces, the clinical spaces that we are um, offering are places that are safe for them to disclose their identity and to have a welcoming experience. And so um, 
I want to propose this model of the four doors that, that has been very helpful, I think, to easily um, start to think about and do a landscape analysis of your own setting. Um, so the first question is, what happens when someone comes in your door? Um, what is the signage that they're seeing? The graphics on the, uh, the wall, is it if it's a place where you are primarily taking care of uterine, ovarian, um, tubal cancer, um, is that the Women's Cancer Center? Or um, are the, is the signage all pink? <laughs> um, these types of things, same with breast cancer. We'll see more of this later. Then, um, and are the people who are taking insurance cards, people who are parking folks, um, people who are rooming individuals comfortable with um, working with people of all genders. Um, next, what happens behind closed doors? And I think, um, Dr. Albert, if you can click once, I think those four. Great, thank you so much. Um, so then what happens behind closed doors in histories and physicals and the information that you're asking, are you asking about gender affirming processes and procedures, thinking about who someone is in their totality? The next is what happens even if you've done all of that work in your own specific clinical space and behind closed doors in your history and physical, what happens when you refer someone out to another um, department or another institution? How's that information carried forward in a real and respectful, accurate way? Um, and then finally, what happens to welcome people into the door? So not just that we um, are taking care of transgender and gender diverse people by happenstance, but really making ourselves a destination of choice. Next. Um, so one of uh, a group of colleagues and I um, wanted to address the fact that many organizations have really recognized non-discrimination policies as a good marker um, and signal to communities and reflection of um, the culture of an institution of how they're taking care of different communities, including the LGBTQ plus community. And so we performed a web-based analysis to evaluate the landscape of patient non-discrimination policies at NC CI designated cancer centers. And we found that while 82% of cancer centers had a patient non-discrimination policy that was accessible in their website, um, and 90% uh, mentioned protection by sex, and 70% by sexual orientation, a little less, 67% by gender identity, none of the policies included sex assigned at birth or LGBTQ plus or SGM identity. And so a big uh, takeaway is that there are actions that we can take that are um, feasible and within our control to help signal and make spaces more welcoming. And we'll talk about a little bit more of what happens when spaces aren't welcoming um, through the qualitative research that we've both conducted. And there's some illustrative quotes um, and experiences that Dr. Albert will go through next. Go ahead. Okay, thank you so much. So now we'll get into um, some of the details of what happens to patients when they present to clinic. And we'll be presenting from both of our qualitative research. And there, there'll be a few themes that we'll describe throughout this section. And the first one is that our institutions themselves may not be welcoming of transgender people and may actually inadvertently exclude them. So um, I'm gonna read a quote from a uh, project I did uh, exploring the experiences of transgender people with cancer. So one of the participants who was a white non-binary person said, I needed to have a lot of follow-up mammograms until I had top surgery. And pretty much every time this was an aggressively gendered experience to the point of, no, I'm not putting on that pink floral gown. You can't make me. You can do it in nothing. I'll put on this wrap I have, or you can get me something else, but I'm literally not doing this. And having to push back really hard against, I don't want to change in the special women's changing room. I don't want to hang out in the special girl mammogram ward, thanks. Surely this is a whole hospital. No doubt you have other places I could sit. And you can imagine that you know already experiencing a cancer diagnosis and dealing with treatment and the follow-up, um, it may be very difficult to be in spaces and be given clothing to wear that explicitly are in, in contrast to how you see yourself. So not only do we need to change how we're talking to people, but the, the uh, institutions in which we work. 
Another way that cancer centers may signal inclusion or exclusion to patients is through our intake forms and what happens at registration. For example, in another study, a Latina trans woman said, starting with how to identify, you don't have options during registration. It's easy for me to sign in as a woman, but then the provider ends up asking me inappropriate questions. For example, when was my last period or if I might be pregnant? And if somebody is asking about your last period or if you might be pregnant, you're put in a situation if you're a trans woman to have to either lie or, or come out to someone who it may not feel safe to come out to. And then after somebody has asked you that question, it may be even more difficult to, to choose to explain to them that you're transgender because they've already signaled that they don't know that or think that your um, existence is a real thing. So the language used by oncology clinicians may also not reflect the bodies or experiences of transgender people. For example, a white non-binary participant said, I remember somebody saying, it's okay, you're still a woman. You can probably still have children. Thank you, no thank you. And so I'm sure that clinician was really trying to, you know, create, build rapport and be close to the patient by, by making this statement, but in fact, really made an assumption that was in fact not the case and um, may have eroded rapport, made it even more difficult for that person to be there. Similarly, in a study about sexual and reproductive health care, a transgender participant said, if you start out the conversation talking about female this or woman that, or only male and female, just a simple statement of female reproductive system or whatever, is just so triggering for gender expansive folks and trans people, that it's like, regardless of what comes after that, there's already a disconnect. That's like, this person is basic and they don't understand who I am. So clinicians are taught to think about gender and sex as synonymous. And because of that, they may tend to get the names, genders, or pronouns of patients wrong. This is called misgendering. And this may be even further exacerbated when clinicians know that patients are transgender. So in one of our qualitative studies, transgender people talked about their experiences after physicians found out that they were transgender. And for example, one black transgender woman said, it wasn't until after I told the doctor that I was on hormones for transition that I started being keyed. In other words, the physician started referring to her with he pronouns. And as accidental or whatever as it was, it was after. Before that, it was she. So in other words, transgender people may face a very difficult dilemma of choosing between the dangers of being open about their identities and the dangers of not giving clinicians all the information they may need for clinical decision-making. For example, that they're on hormones or that they've had particular surgeries. In the same qualitative study, we investigated the experiences of transgender people who reviewed their own electronic health records. And we felt that this was very important given the 21st Century Cures Act which mandates patients access to their own records. So nearly all the patients in our study who had accessed their electronic health record noted the use of the wrong name, pronouns, or gender marker, often referred to as misgendering, which I, which I think I mentioned. So even in the context of otherwise positive relationships with clinicians, and even when clinicians displayed other signs of being welcoming, they described that seeing um, misgendering or stigmatizing language in the electronic health record really eroded their trust, not just in that particular clinician, but the medical field as a whole. So for example, one um, participant said, there's like stickers that are like LGBTQ affirming, blah, blah, yet they both misgendered me in their notes. And many in, people in the study did talk about the performative, the sometimes performative nature of um, inclusiveness. So it brings up the question of how we can really like be authentic in all the places we're communicating with patients. Participants also described the intersectional nature of transphobia and racism through use of the words such as hostile or aggressive in the health records of transgender people of color. For example, one Chicanx non-binary person described the ways that those words were carried forward and used against patients. They said, in the electronic health record, those details that people added in the notes can definitely get used against the patients. Especially if you're a person of color, 
when you're trying to be enforcing pronouns, you'll usually get labeled as hostile. And then that establishes a pattern in your medical record that then is used to treat you poorly or to not be listening to what you're saying. And in fact, there's other literature that supports some of these concepts because we know that um, from that research, we know that negative language in the electronic health record influences the attitudes of other clinicians and causes them to treat patients differently. For example, to treat pain less aggressively. So these, these things are very concerning. Oncologists are also trained to follow guidelines, as you all know, but these may not always be in line with patient priorities. For example, NCCN um, prioritizes uh, fertility sparing interventions that may not be in line with the needs of patients and particularly transgender patients. And we don't always have a lot of guidance about what to do when guidelines are different from patient priorities. So for example, a white non-binary person with ovarian cancer said, because I had a really large tumor, they talked about doing the full hysterectomy or just taking out the one ovary. I wanted the full hysterectomy. And they were like, you don't know. In a few years, you might change your mind. So they did fertility sparing surgery. Um, it's very, it was very distressing, especially in that focus group that this person had gotten a surgery that was not the one that they wanted and really brings up the question of how we can really share decision-making with patients and center their priorities when making decisions about their care. The last concept that we wanted to introduce in this section is that oncology clinicians may be providing incomplete or inaccurate information because of the simplistic ways clinicians in the systems we work in manage information regarding gender anatomy and physiology. So one concern is that we have very limited data regarding the health outcomes of transgender people with cancer and any role that hormones may play in improving or worsening outcomes. And I think this is a concern for patients and clinicians as well. So for example, one transgender woman in one of our studies said, it was good in one way that the doctors had no issues with me continuing hormones and that they thought about it in relation to cancer. And they were like, no, no problem, go ahead, it's fine. But there was no really good critical thought about, oh, you're going through this major hormonal shift at the same time as you're going through chemotherapy. And there wasn't any discussion about that. It's like, okay, you let me do what I needed to do and you didn't interrupt that portion of my transition, but you didn't give me any information. You didn't even try to think critically using your doctoring knowledge. One problem clinicians may have in having these types of conversations with patients is that the data regarding connections between hormone therapy and cancer are of very poor quality, and it may be difficult to know how best to counsel patients. So for example, in the last few years, there were two studies out of the Netherlands um, that both had retrospective data regarding cancer risk for transgender people, transgender women specifically. And um, this one um, got a huge amount of media attention, um, partly because of this sentence that was in the popular press that transgender women have a 47 fold higher risk of developing breast cancer. But um, as I mentioned, the, the, these studies were both retrospective, so correlative, and, and there was no like ability to establish a causal relationship. And also what was um, less well publicized is that transgender women in these studies had lower rates of breast cancer than cisgender women. So it, it brings to mind how the media may be influencing our conversations with patients and what, what we do in the absence of, of um, quality data. Around the same time, this study came out that was looking at prostate cancer risk in transgender women and found lower rates of prostate cancer in transgender women compared to cisgender men. And interestingly, this study got almost no press attention, um, which brings up, you know, What's in, what's in our minds because of the popular press and what does that do to our conversations with patients? So we know that hormone therapy and surgeries decrease uh, suicidality for transgender people who want them and improve quality of life. So when having these conversations with patients, it's really important to understand patient priorities and to weigh the known benefits of hormone therapy and surgeries with the, the unknown but potential risks of hormone therapy in the setting of cancer. The systems that we work in also have been set up to deal with gender and, and sex assigned at birth data in very simplistic ways that do not extrapolate well to the bodies of transgender people and other patients. 
So for example, the laboratory data normal ranges are based on research done on cisgender women and men. And research suggests that transgender people have uh, normal lab values that fall outside of these ranges. So this ends up meaning that the lab values in the charts of transgender people are often flagged, even though this may not be of any clinical or other significance. So consider a transgender man who's registered as a man and flagged as anemic, but is actually not because he menstruates and so has a, a non-pathologically lower hematocrit than uh, cisgender women. And this did come up in one of our qualitative studies, a transgender man um, said, when I get labs done, they have me as female for my lab levels. And so they're always a little bit off and it freaks me out. And I'm like, is this normal? And it is very difficult that patients who now have access to their medical records as well as clinicians are left to interpret these for themselves. Possibly of even greater concern, uh, chemotherapeutic dosing is sometimes based on creatinine clearance, which is based on a sex or gender marker. And we don't have robust data regarding how these algorithms apply or do not apply to transgender people who have had surgeries or on hormone therapy. So in the future, we could consider revising our laboratory ranges to be based on more objective measures that would be relevant, such as volume of distribution, body composition, hormone levels, renal or hepatic function, or a host of other factors that influence drug metabolism and clearance. Thank you. And so with all of those really important voices and stories in mind uh, and building on this idea of where where oncology practice may be missing a mark is that our systems may be holding us back. So this is a screenshot from my EMR, I use Epic, um, in which one of my patients that I was taking care of, um, a non-binary patient of mine who had male listed in um, their medical record, um, assigned female at birth, had a cervix, um, needed contraception, um, and I was taking care of them for cervical dysplasia and I got, you know, this this hard stop saying this diagnosis of dysplasia of the cervix uteri is not valid for the patient's sex, uh, which of course was not true. I was performing the exam, the person was in front of me, it was very valid for their experience, but I was not allowed to chart. And that's obviously a problem just for that individual patient, but then if we extrapolate out, it hinders care more broadly and also hinders research as medical charting diagnosis codes, et cetera, are the foundation of much uh, research endeavors, QI work, et cetera. Next slide, please. So it's really important that we cease the traditional conflation of sex and gender, and we need to disaggregate these important concepts of the organs that somebody has at birth, and currently, which of course may differ both for transgender and gender diverse people as well as cisgender piece of people and disaggregate that from somebody's gender identity, which we do need to know. It's not just about organs, but we need to know and take care of somebody's gender identity as well as their sexual orientation. And actually we have a rubric you know, in medicine to do these things. We systematically go through and we ask medical history, surgical history, meds, family, et cetera, but we need to be sensitized to how we bring gender into that and how we bring gender affirming um, care and processes and experiences of transgender people into all of those components because they influence every single one of those. And I bring up this picture partially because I'm an OBGYN, but also because I think it's a really good um, um, just visual uh, model to consider, which is uh, the picture on the left um, are two gay men. Um, one is uh, transgender, Caden, in the front, um, who's carried, two, um, carried and given birth to two children that he and his partner, Elijah, a cisgender um, gay man, um, have, and they're partnering together. And and we can only imagine that their experiences are quite different as two black gay men um, raising kids than this presumably um, white cisgender couple um, that we see who I actually don't know. But um, we're just, you know, in terms of all of these different multiplicity of experiences and we need to ask and think about how those differences will play out. And unfortunately, there's a lot of um, missing data and inaccuracies here that we need to start to debunk um, and address. So um, next slide, you know, if we think about research, um, this is a um, uh, just a presentation of some inclusion criteria from a clinical trial about prostate cancer. And if you look on the left, the inclusion criteria says male greater than 18 years of age, but what about women? 
who may also have prostate cancer, right? Transgender women. And um, also, you know, participants must agree to using condom if they are having sex with a woman. So what do they mean by sex? And what do they mean by women here? Um, it, there are obviously assumptions of, uh, that are threaded throughout this. And in addition, in terms of the exclusion criteria, they mention hormone therapy for prostate cancer. But as Dr. Alpert mentioned, we know actually that transgender women likely have lower prostate cancer, um, at least in one study. We need more studies, right? And so what about estrogens for transition? Um, finally, when we think about excluding people with current infections um, such as HIV, Unfortunately, currently, transgender women have very high um, prevalence of HIV, um, and so we may be excluding whole swaths of the population who still get uh, prostate cancer despite um, also having HIV. So who's being included, who's being excluded? And we need to think very uh, strategically about this um, so that we're providing accurate and inclusive care. Next slide, please. So we reviewed um, with some colleagues uh, ovarian cancer guidelines, and we noticed the word woman appears 100 times. It's just one example, but you can imagine these guidelines will not promote use of gender consistent language with people's identities for men or non-binary people with ovaries. And you can imagine that providers then aren't sensitized to how to take care of people. Um, and this was the case of Robert Eads, um, a man pictured here on the bottom who um, was turned away from 12 oncologists office um, for treatment of his ovarian cancer because they said that they didn't know how to care for a man with cancer, essentially. Um, Next, um, similarly, we looked at prostate cancer guidelines and sort of the same story. Um, the word men appears 472 times, um, rather than being specific to the organs. And in that way, it wouldn't have really provided helpful guidance to taking care of someone like Sally Paines here, who um, a woman of trans experience who died of prostate cancer. Um, and so we have to really think about what we're putting out and um, how this just isn't meeting our population. So. One example of potential practical alternatives is represented here, um, where you know the concern for risk-reducing salpingectomy uh, alone is that people with at least one ovary, because actually that's the most relevant piece, right? Um, not women, because they could have ovaries or not, right? So it's just the presence of the ovary or people who menstruate versus uh, premenopausal women. Um, so we need to get much more specific. Next slide. Um, so as you go back to your day, as we start to close up here, we want you to just start to critically assess your own materials, your own space, and think about, you know, is what you're putting out there inclusive, exclusive, thinking certainly about gender, but also race, ethnicity, skin color, age, gender, ability, and size. And so this can take you into thought experiments and, and really looking at what elements of the visuals in your clinical settings promote inclusion and in what domains um, and what images, um, decoration, signage, et cetera, promote exclusion and in what domains. And the real promise here is that we can get it right, right? So, you know, um, this is also from um, one of our research studies where uh, Dr. Albert's study actually that said, you know, as soon as uh, a trans man I know talked about his gender experience with his gynecologist, they were very careful to not use gender language during the exam. And it was all very matter of fact. They actively took ste steps to minimize any chest exposure, referring to chest tissues, breasts, and things of that nature. And this is a, a promising um, quote, but it also, it, would encourage us to not wait for us to um, know, you know, that uh, this is a trans person that we're supporting, but rather just to make all of our practices um, welcoming and inclusive. With that, I'll turn it back to Dr. Alpert to finish us out here. So some good news is that ASCO actually is making changes to their guidelines. And recently we changed the guideline template to ensure that all the guidelines that are created are done so with gender inclusive language. So if you uh, want to, you can scan these QR codes to see both the new methodology manual and the first um, guideline that came out using gender inclusive language and with comments about why that's being done. So there are a number of next steps that Yale Cancer can take, and these are just some of our ideas, but really we want um, you all to be thinking about what, what you think would work best for your center. 
And then, you know, we talked earlier about EMR best practices, and we would recommend these that patients' names, genders, pronouns are correctly and consistently documented throughout the EMR, that words like preferred or identifies as in describing patients' genders, pronouns, or names are eliminated, and that words that may um, suggest stigma or blame, like disturbed or hostile, are removed from the record. We would also suggest, um, based on the recommendations of patients, avoiding unnecessary mention of sex assignment or so-called biological sex, because often um, those things can be communicated by describing anatomy or um, other factors. We also listed some individual, uh, some steps for individuals, and these slides will be available after, so I won't go through these in depth, but we wanted you to have you know, something you could do right now, today, to change your practice and change um, the practice at your institution. And then here are some training and resources that are available for any cancer center um, in case you want to do more work around these topics. And we want to remind, oh, sorry, Dr. Obin and Oliver. Yeah, well, we, we all live in society today and I think it would be hard if, if you hadn't noticed the news that there are some very active fights going on for trans, uh, transgender and LGBTQ plus people broadly. Um, just to mention that there are 147 anti-transgender bills that were introduced in 2021 that are being either addressed or seen now. And just um, two weeks ago, Idaho House approved legislation that makes it a felony for a doctor to provide um, gender affirming care. And so we as, as citizens need to also be taking, uh, uh, taking care and thinking about these things and advocating because it influences our patients uh, and it influences our society. And then the last plug I'll put in here, just my own little plug, is if you have LGBTQ plus patients, we really encourage you to ask them um, and uh, to be involved in research. And so one way, just one study is the PRIDE study, um, which uh, you can learn about here, pridestudy.org, which is the next slide. Um, and with that, I think we'll move to questions and then know that there's actually dozens of slides after this that give some more information and resources, et cetera. So we encourage you to check out those slides as well. And our contact information is here on the next slide, as well as an evaluation. Um, we, you know, good for each of our portfolios and to, in, to in, you know, enhancing our future talks. So thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you so much. Um, so I just want to really thank you for your vulnerability, first of all, in sharing your own stories and um, really giving us the language to start enacting change. And, um, and I really, I think my own takeaways, um, you know, we want our patients to feel seen. And I think we want, you know, and language matters. And so I think, um, so I thank you for that. What a fantastic talk. So I'd love to turn to the chat with a couple of questions. Um, some were, we had a couple on EHR. So one was on, thank you for this informative session. Do you know if any hospitals or cancer centers have a process to flag inappropriate EHR notes and to address the behavior and fix them? No. Either of you can address that? Yeah. The short answer, at least from my end, is no. I don't know of any such um, policies or procedures in place to to manage this sort of data. Yeah, I don't either, but I think that our patients are telling us already. And so it's kind of starting from the education place that we don't fix it. And then you all can be champions now. So I often notice it in colleagues' notes um, and I, gently point it out to them and say, hey, maybe this is a template, but you got to fix the template. <laughs> so, or, you know, the um, patient, you know, came back to me or other patients have come to me to, to not, you know, um, and say, hey, can you fix this? I noticed this is inconsistent throughout the record. Yep, exactly. And Dr. Alpert, if you don't mind unsharing, and then maybe we can um, see bigger. Absolutely. Perfect. Yeah, That's thanks. great. Thank you. For the last, we'll have a five, five more minutes and uh, for questions. Has I also, um, there's a question about clinical trial eligibility, and I think as a cancer center, that's a um, primary mission of ours, and I think I, I loved that you brought that up, 
And, um, you know, we have eligibility around doing pregnancy tests and eligible. So really, I think, um, great to raise that. So one of the questions is, has there been a review of clinical trial eligibility criteria for appropriate inclusion? So again, I don't, I don't know of any such um, research, although I think it would be wonderful to do that. We, we really, you know, did these looks at the guidelines and clinical trial data in preparation for some conversations with NCCN and the FDA. But I think a more rigorous look at maybe even a qualitative analysis or natural language processing tool to look at inclusion and exclusion criteria for cancer clinical trials would be um, really super, would really potentially give us more, more data to drive change and bring these issues to the fore. Yeah, and I would say in all research, you know, we, we really need to think about what we're measuring and why. <laughs> um, so it's actually not appropriate to just say women, right? Because if, if say you're doing a study on uterine cancer, only people with uteruses can be, you know, um, have uterine cancer or develop it, but that could be transgender men, it could be non-binary people, it can't be pe somebody who lives as a woman who was born with a congenital absence of the uterus actually inaccurate. So we really want to say, you know, anybody who has or had a, uterine, you know, a uterine cancer or depending on the criteria and just to be very specific. And it may be that it's really only relevant for, you know, cisgender women, but we need to so state and say why, right? Um, and we also need to think retrospectively about research and point this out as a limitation where um, we are extrapolating, you know, I'm extrapolating from studies on cisgender women to you, this transgender man in front of me, and this is the areas that I don't understand right now. And so we need to partner around that. This is mechanistically how I think XYZ would work. I don't know, you know, um, and, and we're working to fill that in. Um, and so that's that's what the NIH is calling for. And I would challenge every researcher here is familiar with the NIH, you know, um, uh, requirement on uh, describing sex as a biological variable. And so in that statement, we need to actually, you know, carry that forward and really be critical on, on, on what that's really asking for. And I routinely in my NIH grants say, I can report on sex assigned at birth. I cannot report on gender. I will not report people by man and woman because that's actually irrelevant um, or, you know, some other permutation depending on the specific research. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, there's an, an interesting question on a chaperoning um, um, by Dr. Kim, one of our GU medical oncologists. So what are your thoughts on the use of chaperones for examining transgender patients? Well, I think we should think about, you know, where, it's a great question, but I think I always like to think, what am I going to do routinely to make situations better for everybody? Um, and so likely there is a place where a patient advocate may be good for every person, right? So I'm often as an OBGYN who identifies and reads as, as a woman, often women patients don't think anything of it, but then as soon as a male or male presenting colleague of mine comes in, they think about that. But you know, there's actually nothing to say that I may be, and I hope I never am, but inappropriate or do something sexually inappropriate with a woman patient just because I'm a woman. And so if we, we really should think probably about chaperoning for everyone, understanding that more people in the room may or may not be better. And so I think we need to think about that and or I often have partners in the room, chaperones, I often have a nurse in the room for everybody actually. I think that's a, a wonderful comment. So we are nearing the hour in the final minute um, remaining. I'd love for both of you maybe in kind of one sentence to say what you are hoping the field will do. Leave us with kind of a, a, a dream for the future. Dr. Alpert, we'll start with you. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think that in my mind, the most important thing right now is to rethink the ways that we have conflated gender and sex assigned at birth. And if we can disaggregate those ideas and concepts, both in the ways that we're talking to patients and thinking about bodies, but also the ways that we're writing guidelines, um, thinking about lab values, thinking about chemotherapeutic dosing, I think will really change the landscape, not just for transgender people, but to provide better care for all our patients. 
Thank you, Dr. Obadan Malver. Absolutely, so many things. First of all, just thank you, everybody. Um, I would say that um, it really, there's often this sort of doom and gloom kind of idea about um, working <laughs> with and supporting transgender and gender diverse people who do face so many challenges, but I also think incredibly strong and resilient communities who actually have so much to show us about all of our medicine and healthcare and, and, and the assumptions that we make that really are a detriment to all of our patients, right? So we could learn so much about, you know, hormone management, about mechanisms of, you know, presence or absence of certain experiences, hormones, organs, et cetera, that uh, really what transgender and gender diverse people offer us is this incredible gift to examine our assumptions and to become much, much more accurate and actually pre precise in our health. So this is truly precision health and meeting people and the diversity of people where we're at. And if we can you know, decode the genome, we can actually <laughs> you know, meet individuals where they're at on all these axes of their identities and experiences and to provide really excellent care. Thank you. Well, thank you both of you for really a um, fantastic presentation and one that I hope our listeners will have some really concrete takeaways and really become advocates in this space. So I, I thank you for that. Um, doctors Obin and Malover and Alpert have agreed to stay on um, for the next hour um, for our trainees. So I encourage the trainees to stay on, but I think if there are other people who would enjoy staying on, we would welcome that. Um, you will be, so stay on, you will be promoted to host so that everyone can see each other. Um, Dr. Barbara Burtness is here as our um, Associate Director of DEI for the Cancer Center and will be leading the next session. So thank you everybody so much. Thank you for that, that wonderful um, <laughs> tour um, and com completely, I think, um, different to the, the kinds of Grand Rounds talks that we have often hosted. Love it. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's particularly wonderful that you're willing to, to stay on and um, field questions and, and have no, some discussion um, with, with the fellows. Um, so let's just give them a minute um, to join. And, you know, and Ash, I'm going to sign off, but that okay, was just you. amazing. And I, it's so great to see you both. And um, I hope we can continue some collaborations. And um, so I, I know our fellows will get a lot out of this. So thank you for agreeing to both of these sessions. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you again. Thank you. You're so welcome. Bye. Bye bye. Hi, Dr. Burtness. Hi, Dr. Alper and Dr. Obden Malvern. Hi. Hello. Um, so, um, uh, oh, yeah. I was, I was going to introduce you. Ben is one of the chief. Oh, OK. Please. <laughs> <laughs> and has, has actually been amazing in the role. Um, we've introduced a DEI uh, curriculum to our fellowship, sort of uh, under his leadership. Careful. Great. Very exciting. I have to apologize. The timing did not work out so great, or the scheduling did not work out so well because um, our ASH in-service exam is also so today. So terrible. a portion of our fellows are unfortunately unavailable. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think we do have trainees from um, some of the other uh, training programs as well, in, in addition to hematology oncology. So I, I wonder if we, if the people who are still on, if we should go around and do introductions or if there's another way we should start? Um, it, it would also be great to the extent that some of you can um, uh, turn your videos on. Um, I, I, I was you know, thinking that we would do this in a very informal way, if that's okay with um, the two of you. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I, I know when you're putting together a talk, even as a single speaker, there's all kinds of stuff you have to leave out. And then when there are two of you, um, so there, there may be things that you want to go into in, um, in more depth as well. But um, so I'll, I'll start. I'm Barbara Burtness. I'm a medical oncologist. Um, and I'm the interim uh, associate director for DEI. And um, uh, 
trying to build a uh, educational environment that fosters um, culture change here. Um, ben, we already introduced, I guess, um, Nick. Uh, I presume that's me, hello, Nick. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I am a fifth year PhD candidate in the Townsend lab. We do a lot of cancer work um, in computational biology. And I was a trainee of the cancer biology training program. Julia? I am Julia. I'm a fourth year medical oncology fellow um, doing breast cancer uh, clinical care and research and will be a breast medical oncologist. Um, wonderful to see you uh, shine. Um, it's one of uh, our external advisors, but it's great to have you here. Well, I had this on my calendar because I got the permission. I'm not sure how, but I was thrilled. This is a wonderful presentation. Uh, my name is Shine Chang. I'm a cancer epidemiologist on faculty at MD Anderson Cancer Center. I also am a training program director for our cancer prevention research training program. And I'm also a uh, multiple PI of a new course for skills development. We don't have not officially gotten our um, NOGA yet, but um, our project is to provide uh, early career researchers with cancer education, um, uh, cancer research uh, orientation for those who are interested in SGM cancer research. So, <laughs> great, thank you. I'm just calling on people as you appear on my screen, Mark Casey. Um, and Renee, I don't know if you wanna, um, Turn your video on. Uh, Renee is our communications director in the Cancer Center. Sure. Hi, everyone. We met earlier before Grand Island started. So thank you again for doing this. All your help and support. Sejal? Hi, my name is Sejal. I am one of the first year hematology oncology fellows here. And I am interested in providing care for the young adult early onset cancer uh, population. Eileen? Okay, some people may be. Um, oh, Eileen says her desktop uh, does not have a micro camera. Um, Okay, thank you for joining us. And um, Liz? Well, can't hear you, Liz. Okay, um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> one last person is David Schoenfeld, one of the fellows. David, if you want to just briefly introduce yourself. Sure. Hi, uh, my name is David. I'm one of the third year fellows um, on the research track. So I have a couple more years left. I'm working uh, with Harry Kluger doing kidney cancer research and interested in immunotherapy. And I just wanted to thank you for the very uh, wonderful and interesting talk today. Thank you. So um, I'm sorry, sorry can you hear me now? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we can. I'm sorry. Um, I'm, I um, saw about the lecture, uh, much like um, Shine, uh, it got forwarded to me somehow. Um, I'm actually at um, The Ohio State University, um, James Cancer Hospital. I am an advanced practice nurse and a nurse scientist doing um, research in this area. And so when I saw that um, Drew now and Ash were presenting, I had to listen in. <laughs> so I'm just eavesdropping to, to hear what else is going on. So thanks so much. Great. Okay, well, um, maybe the first thing I'll do is just um, ask uh, if people have um, questions that they want to um, throw out, and, and if not, I have a few, so. Sure. Dr. Burtness, do you want people to um, throw their questions into the chat, or should we just I kind think of throw it's only 15 form? of us. I think people can just, I, I mean, um, for those of you who have no mic, um, Eileen, postdoctoral fellow in translational oncology in the RIM lab, um, part of the CBTP training program. 
um, her mic is off, so we'll ask her to use the chat. But for those of you who, who can, I think I'd like this to be conversational and, and um, interactive, if that's okay with everybody. Yeah. Quick question. I guess I'll, I'll kind of give you two, two lines of um, thinking and let, let y'all go down whatever road you feel like. Um, one is about like the, there are um, traditionally different uh, approaches to care for different diseases, often based on these sort of sex-informed approaches. And um, trans people, you know, cancer is a disease that, that thrives on like dis, uh, disruptions in signaling. And it seems like there's a lot of, uh, for people who elect to have like a medical and hormonal sort of aspect to their transition, um, there might be some places where, uh, without you know necessarily undergoing entire clinical trials, you can adjust the the sort of dosage and, and care of people based off of what we know about signaling. So I, I wanted to know if if there was any thoughts about um, that or the, the the other thing that comes to mind is the need for like because. Um, medical record and even a medical ontology are like require this labeling and hierarchical structure in order for them to just sort of technically function. How is that like what what are some tips for addressing trans folk who don't necessarily like applying labels to themselves, uh, especially in ways that don't uh, that aren't founded in medical jargon, I should say. I mean, I can speak to the second question first. I think the first question, it might be helpful, at least for me, to get a little more detail about the sort of scenarios you're thinking about. Um, but in terms of the second question, I mean, what I can say kind of like broadly is that we know from our qualitative research that oftentimes part of what is helpful and what trans people want is to share the decision making around what is in the electronic health record. And to know, you know, the, the pros and cons of various decisions. So there may be, you know, various implications to the gender marker in the chart or the other demographics that are there, including issues related to insurance coverage and billing, um, issues in terms of being out and who's accessing the, the medical record. So what a lot of people have said in our studies is, you know, I really appreciated when my physician said, I need a diagnosis to prescribe hormones. What would you like that diagnosis to be? Um, or brought up other issues like that. And then, um, yeah, I think in terms of your first question about signaling, I think I would, I would appreciate any specific scenarios that you're thinking of to try to answer your question better. Yeah, I mean, there are, it's, it's hard because it's like there's a thousand different treatments for a thousand different things, but even just thinking like there's speculative roles and pathways for things like, um, VEGF isoforms uh, and how they're different among physiological signaling and thinking about like VEGF inhibitors as a, as a key aspect for, in, for preventing uh, vascularization and metastases and, and cancer. Like if there is some, some sense in which uh, medically transitioning trans folk have physiological states that are neither like are in between or somewhat liminal uh, and signaling states, if there are ways to adjust dosages to represent that uh, sort of liminal state. Well, I would say that's really why we need more inclusion and in research because the, the challenge right now is that there are definitely trans folks in clinical cancer trials, but we can't see who they are. We don't know you know, they're dosing on various hormones. We don't know when they're going on and off and kind of cumulative dose. And so we don't know how that's informing things. And so we need to, you know, at the very fundamental level, ask uh, in respectful, real relevant ways so that we can get much more specific and understand instead of just saying man and woman, I mean, we, we all know, you know, cisgender men have a broad range of, you know, testosterone levels. Cisgender women have a broad range of estrogen progestin levels. And we, there's a lot we don't know about that. But if we're really going to get into precision health, we really need to think for everybody. Like we, 
we've got to be doing this better, right? Like, why is there a preponderance of certain cancers that are certain hormonal states or whatnot? And so actually, this is the opportunity that I was trying to speak to is that trans people actually really pre present us this incredible opportunity to understand more <laughs> about um, these various um, components, at, specifically as it pertains to cancer care, I think, um, you know, we're, we're some hormones, estrogen, progestin, testosterone positive, right? But what does that mean for somebody who's going on and off or was actively using um, blockers or other things? And how does that then, what does that teach us about the mechanisms of how these neoplastic processes um, advance? But we just don't have that. We don't have those models sorted out yet for anybody. Um, so if we could really deliver on this promise of more accurate inclusion of variables and re really rethinking, and not just saying men and women, right, but really rethinking from an ontological perspective, what is what are the questions that we're asking um, so that it we can get our arms around everyone, we'll learn a lot more for everybody's cancer care, I think. Uh, maybe just just building off that, I mean, you, you've referred to ASCO and NCCN and, and FDA. Um, a lot of the most impactful clinical trials in cancer recently have been industry studies. Um, and, you know, they obviously write things that FDA will be, will accept. Um, but unless there's a mandate from FDA to change things, my experience is that they are very comfortable continuing to do things exactly the way they did them in 1975. And um, I'm just wondering, have, have there been formal conversations with um, Big Pharma and, or have you been involved in, in writing studies in, with industry partners where um, you've attempted to, to address inclusion and eligibility criteria? No, I mean, I can say that, you know, about a year ago, the FDA did convene like a sexual and gender minority, um, like one day workshop where we did start to talk about some of these issues. And in fact, are writing a manuscript to talk about how we would suggest changing um, clinical trial inclusion and exclusion criteria and a myriad of other factors to really better get data that can be extrapolated to all people. But I don't know of folks I don't know of folks who are working with industry to figure out how to make that more um, widely disseminated. And I don't really know um, what all the steps would be in trying to create an FDA mandate. I know that the FDA has issued some guidance around um, exclusion criteria as it res relates to HIV diagnoses. And I think like similar um, strategies could be employed to talk about some of these other issues, but I, I am not 100% sure what the way forward will look like, but I am very interested to, to figure that out and to work with, with all of you to build something better than what we currently have. And there are efforts from the FDA, so building on what Dr. Albert just mentioned, I think that it, you know it's a slow process and there's a lot of areas of, of um, unknowns, um, but the FDA actually, born out of the Office of Women's Health has been looking into this. And what I put in was um, a presentation actually that was done and hosted by the FDA um, from um, the Office of Women's Health uh, two years, three years ago now. Um, and there are slides where they, you know, they say sex is not gender and they, and they start to like you know, break that apart. So I think that there is increasing awareness. And I think you know, it's, it's kind of like a bi-directional challenge, right? Like we, we needed to come, you know, from the FDA, we needed to come from researchers who were saying like, this doesn't work and challenging that. And, and there's often this, this handshake, especially in academic medical centers where um, uh, industry initiated studies um, still work with, you know, uh, academic colleagues to, to run them and, and vice versa. Um, so, you know, if there's challenges coming from all different directions, I think that's how we can start to move forward. Great, thank you. I have a quick question specifically about the types of cancers that are hormonally driven in their pathophysiology and also that depend on hormones for our treatment. So thinking about breast cancer, my field, um, would you have any um, suggestions in terms of 
of how to deal with the potentially conflicting um, mechanisms of, um, for example, our treatments for breast cancer that might be directly conflicting with, with a, a medication that someone is taking for transition, um, how to handle those situations. So, I mean, I think that, you know, all people have hormones in their body, you know, exogenous or endogenous hormones. And there are various ways that we feel like we need to, to change hormone levels in patients based on the type of cancer that they have. So I think just like all people with hormones talking about, you know, the risks and benefits of continuing to have the same levels of hormones in your body. So I think in the case of like an estrogen receptor positive breast cancer for um, a trans woman on estrogen therapy, I think probably the conversation is very similar to a cisgender woman who needs to go on an aromatase inhibitor. Um, but I think that what I think can be really important is just making sure that we're understanding patients' priorities, understanding their, their concerns, talking about the real data that we have, even data that we need to extrapolate, and then like making a joint decision. I've definitely heard transgender people say, you know, I'd rather, this is like sort of a different scenario, but like I'd rather die having had the surgery that I wanted than, than not having had it. So I think the best that we can do for our patients is talk about risks and benefits of any intervention in therapy and then like work with them to make the decision that feels best for them. Thank you. I think there's also this just this added piece of like if it is say a breast cancer in a transgender man who's already had top surgery right like understanding that there's like this whole other potential layer may or may not be relevant for any one individual but of like you know or you doing cancer for a transgender man you know that there may be this other layer of like god this piece of my body and experience that may not be like in line with my identity is now this, you know, is now going to kill me or potentially, you know, these kinds of questions come up for people. Now that's not true for everyone. And I, that's actually something I was very surprised about um, in, in my work on pregnancy and fertility um, in trans and gender expensive people. I expected, you know, along before I did my first study on pregnancy experiences and, and trans masculine folks that everybody would have a bad experience of being pregnant. And, you know, that was just my assumption going in. And then a lot of people didn't, you know, they're like, yeah, I'm a pregnant guy. What's the deal? Like I have this organ, it works. It's how I became a father. Um, so, you know, but then certainly people did have this for it. And some people were like, yeah, I just, you know, stomached through this very you know, woman gendered experience of like dealing with this organ that everybody associates with motherhood and womanhood and whatever. So for some people, you know, I really am working with them and saying like, yeah, I know that this is this added element of a gendered experience that doesn't work for you. How can I support you in that? And for some people it's like, well, cancer just sucks. So like, we're just going to deal with that. But knowing that, you know, there's, there's a potential there that it has this additional element. And it's really just about meeting that person who's in front of you, knowing that, you know, discrimination, stigma, and per pervasive gender norming is at play in most scenarios and, and being willing to talk about that. So like when I send somebody for a transvaginal ultrasound, I say, hey, how do you feel about that? Like, is, is that you know, have you ever had one? Are you concerned about it? Some people are like, nope, not a problem. Some people are like, yes, I don't want to be, you know, <laughs> there's no way. And, and I do that with my cisgender patients too, you know? So I just like, that's something that actually I've learned from a lot of trans people to really stop and slow down. Like, what are we doing to your body? What are my assumptions here? How am I talking about these procedures? Is this going to meet you? Is this going to affirm you? How can I make it better? Ash and Juno, I don't know if you could um, see what was in, in the chat. Sure. Um, but Eileen had a question um, about bystander intervention and any advice for trainees to interrupt, gently correct more senior colleagues. And, and then actually, um, 
really resonated with with me as well because we've had a lot of conversations here about just um, people really don't know what to say and they yeah so uh, maybe you could address Eileen's question as globally as possible. It's funny that that question just showed up in the chat because I was actually just thinking of asking the trainees um, if they'd like to share any experiences they've had um, like this one where they're seeing um, maybe patients being um, treated in a stigmatizing way or they themselves have experienced stigma from patients or colleagues because I think that um, these conversations are so important to have, maybe not even as a question and answer, but how can we all talk collectively about these experiences and, and what we're doing about them? Because I think that I know that this is something that I've struggled with throughout medical training. Um, so I would love to hear any experiences you all wanna share, um, both about like situations that have been difficult or how you've managed them. Maybe, maybe I can start. So um, actually one, this, is, this was one question, one topic I wanted to bring up, this question of like bystander um, scenarios and training. And um, I, I guess I don't have one specific um, example um, specifically about um, sexual minorities that comes to mind. But what I can say is that in all of our previous um, discussions uh, during this, the, the, DEI series that Dr. Burns had mentioned. Um, this is the number one question that always comes up. And one of the most important topics of discussions is, um, you know, what, what, what are actual items and how can we go about um, on an individual level making changes in the environment? Um, so I, I don't know that I have like a specific example, but it is something that hopefully we can um, discuss further. Maybe other folks have some examples to provide as well. I know it comes up all the time. Uh, I think we see it on a daily basis in terms of gender discrimination more broadly, um, in terms of um, uh, you know underrepresented minorities um, in both clinical and also professional academic situations. Yeah, I was actually Shine going to just call you out because you um, you put in this comment. Um, you know, that you're sort of grateful that you don't have to face this in the clinical space, but I wonder if um, uh, speaking up as a bystander isn't pretty similar in many different arenas. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I think that there are components, there's, there's sort of role playing, there's practicing, there's learning how to, to speak up. There's being part of a community where everybody speaks up, so that gets modeled for you. Um, there's affirming people who speak up um, and you know giving them some credit for it. But just from your training perspective, um, you know, I'd, I'd love to hear what you. Um, oh, and Juno's just put in a thing about Stanford's um, stand up uh, or upstander um, training. But um, yeah, that's very cool. Um... I've just clicked on it and we'll be sharing that with our trainees too. Um, thank you for that. Um, so my training program, we are starting to work more on imposter phenomenon, uh, ability mindset and perceived discrimination and the intersection of these experiences um, with, our, with regard to training research uh, trainees. Um, but the conversation here is about if I understand more correctly, that it's really more about like in a clinical setting and you know how to sort of manage that power dynamic if you're seeing something happen and how to intervene. So this is sort of the, you know, just as um, Gino sent us uh, about upstander or bystander intervention. So um, I'm not very good at this. I'm still learning how to, you know, what many tools there might be. But one of the things I always think about is um, asking questions. You know, oh, I didn't understand that. Could you explain more about that? Things like that. One of the things I was about, I was typing, Barbara, when you were um, calling me out there was um, something I used when I was a postdoc, which is to request in-service training for everyone. 
So I wonder if maybe, you know, junior colleagues, trainees can ask for in-service for everyone on these topics. How can we do better? How does this um, affect our, our patients? Uh, how can we support each other? And so once the request is made and once it is delivered, then people have a more common basis for having these conversations because then you can remind each other, oh, remember at that you know, workshop that we have, we talked about this. Oh, let's, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I have a lot to offer, but I think that um, perhaps there might be others who have, you know, some training or better training and we could request their help. Well, Juno, can you tell us about um, the upstander life? <laughs> Yeah, so this is an initiative out of Stanford and, and really recognizing this, you know, that, that this is, I think, just like you all were mentioning, this was like the most common thing that was coming up. And so the response was to really like, how do I help people um, and recognizing that like, you know, bystanders or what, you know, through this training is called you know, up standards or hopefully to champion people like actually, you know, acting and, and being engaged and, and being champions through being upstanders um, as moving away from just bystanders and that those are the often the largest percentage of people in the room or who are witnessing things and that that's actually those are the folks that need to be um, mobilized to really create culture change um, but how do we do that and so this was Stanford's response to um, tool you know people asking for tools and, and department by department, um, these trainings are happening. Um, and it's really did initiate in terms of sort of thinking about um, discrimination and sexism in, in sort of the most traditional concepts and, and thinking about um, equity for women and then has, has broadened out to really recognize um, diversity across the gender spectrum and other axes of identity and, and difference. Um, so actually across the traditional like quote unquote traditional like sexism and racism were like kind of the, the two pillars that people were like, how do I say something now that I'm sort of sensitized? And, and now people have understood that this it's actually broader um, than that. So this is, you know, sort of one approach. I think the big thing is, you know, recognition and and talking about it. And 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 I think also I really am, am empathize with trainees. I think trainees are in a really complicated situation and that that has to be recognized and that there are really intense power dynamics um, in the hierarchies of medicine where, you know, we can say, oh, no, 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 talk about it. But there, sometimes there really are reprisals and re there really is backlash. And so we really understanding like what are safe spaces for people to, um, to do that. And also noting that upstanders, there's a vulnerability there and people may be sensitized to being upstanders because it's part of their own identity or experience. And then that may put people in a very vulnerable position. And so some, t some of the strategies around, you know, partnering with essentially, this is the place where allies um, uh, come in, you know, so like if you are uh, a white cisgender um you know, able-bodied person, like really taking that step as a, you know, when you see it, you know, when I see it, it's like, it's, it's on me to act. Um, if I'm seeing racism happening, it's, uh, so I'm seeing, you know, ableism happening, if I'm seeing um, really disparaging remarks um, around um, transphobia, other things, because I'm not as personally vulnerable, and it's effectively therefore easier for me, um, and takes that burden off my colleague who is, in uh, an even more vulnerable situation that having been said, you know, thinking about how that's done so it doesn't take away or, you know, um, uh, do it in such a way that, that um, disempowers or um, takes voice away from individuals and or comes in as a savior, you know, so it, it's not easy. If it was easy, it would have already been solved. But I think just this, like, active training, we get trained on so many things, right? Like, so this is active training we all need to do and challenge ourselves to do every day. If I could just make a personal comment to the junior people, and I, I'm by no means am I suggesting that you go out and, you know, become target practice for people in power. But if you don't say anything, then 30 years later, you're working in the same crappy environment that you hated when you were a trainee 
plus it's on you that you never said anything. <laughs> you know, um, and I think I was a generation that felt like, well, and, and I really, I came right after the class action suit, first class in my medical school that was 50% women, first class of interns at Yale that was 50% women. Like I, it was right at that time. And I think we had this naive idea that as long as we could show that we could do all the work the same as everybody else, um, it would work out. And, you know, 30 years later, that's clearly not what happened, right? And so, uh, you know, absolutely you have to, you know, be careful. But I also think there is a burden on you keeping quiet as well. Yeah, uh, let me pile onto that comment, Barbara. I think that um, often we think as individuals that we have very little power. Um, and sometimes that's true. But what I have learned, especially being an epidemiologist, is that when we band together and we collect data, we have a huge amount of power. And I love that slide that um, Ash and Juno that you shared at the beginning about, um, I wrote it down actually, um, about how systemic oppression leads to disparities and invisibility leads to inaccuracies and substandard care. I'm like, yes, yes, yes. And we can dispel that with data. So when junior people band together and they, and they say, oh, we, we took a survey of all the residents and fellows and we found a very you know, high level of dissatisfaction with, turns out the people in leadership, they kind of quake in their boots. You know, They really don't like that kind of thing. And so sometimes it's about recognizing that you do have power, but you have to harness it. You have to collect the data and then you have to have a, a unified voice to make a request. That's what I was saying about you know, being able to, um, you know, uh, uh, ask for things, you know, ask for the in-service, you know, and coming from a junior level, it's appropriate for you to ask for, for in-service stuff that then benefits everybody. So you can have your hidden agenda that will, you know, help fix the world, but, uh, you know, be sure to tap into the power that you actually have. So, I, you know, I, I try to tell this with, to students as well, because students often feel like they have no power. And I say, actually, you have so much power because the faculty hate when you are unhappy because it causes trouble for them. So same for, you know, people in training, uh, all people in training, um, it's really important. And yeah, there are dinosaurs at the top and in leadership, but there are also advocates and champions as well. So you just have to find them and get them to help work from all different directions, just like Ash okay. and Juno were saying. It has to be everybody together, not just the leaders or the seniors or whatever. That's what I used to think when I was a junior person. Oh, well, I'll leave it to the adults, let them fix everything. And then when I'm a senior person, I'll help. Well, no, 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 that's not how it works. That's not how we advance change, at least not in my lifetime. So it has to come from everywhere, which is you know, the message that Ash and Gina were sharing with us and, and Barbara too, thank you. Yeah, I would also say, I think it, it's, it's dangerous though to like only rely on the trainees because it, it, you know, recognizing that there is just incredible vulnerabilities, you know, so I get emails all the time from LGBTQ plus like med students, undergrads, residents, fellows saying, you know, can I be out? Like, this is a significant portion of my work. I don't know. I was asked totally illegal, egregious things on the you know, residency and fellowship trail still, I get asked terrible and egregious things as an assistant professor, like, you know, so all that's to say, I totally so much agree, and it has to be multi-directional, but I think it's also really important that we protect our trainees oh, yeah. and recognize that, like, there are certain things that we could do today, you know, stroke of the pen. So how are you asking about gender on, like, you know, intake forms, interview forms, are we asking people's pronoun? I mean, those things like that is, that is settled science. Like we should all be asking that actually. <laughs> um, like no more is needed from our trainees to say. And sadly, I think that the, the challenge is that um, I see trainees spending so much time and energy just trying to make these spaces safe for themselves and for patients and for colleagues that they actually are at a you know at a disadvantage actually in terms of grants in terms of papers in terms of just studying for whatever tests because they are working so hard um, so it's 
I would never say don't work on it, but also I, I'm like, you know, we, we don't need any more actually research on racial disparities to know that we need to change things. We also actually don't need much more on <laughs> gender differences to realize like we've just missed the boat in terms of having a binary notion of gender. And we have a lot of solutions out there that we Absolutely. all just need to enact. Absolutely. And yeah. And, and I, I didn't mean to suggest totally that. no i just want to like say that because yeah, i yeah. i am there as a mentor like to people who are you know and and myself too i mean i was told many times not to do this as my career lest yeah. lest i i be shunned in the world of medicine and i couldn't not of but course. it's been hard very hard you yeah. know frankly uh, it would have been a lot easier to study like preterm labor or something <laughs> you know but well, but that's not what we do, right? We go for the stuff that's important to us. And in that passion, we can do better. So thank you for doing that. Thank you for taking on that challenge. Now, as a senior person, I will say that I have an obligation. I have a responsibility to help the field. And so that means pulling people up, okay? So when it comes time for promotion and need for support and things like that, I want people to come to me and say, would you, would you be able to write a good letter for me? And I say, yes, absolutely. Because we need better people, more better people, more thoughtful, different perspectives, all that kind of stuff to populate the field at all levels. So, you know, the idea of like, you know, knowing who the champions and advocates are is really critical because, you know, what the junior people, what the trainees cannot and maybe should not take on themselves, that can be shared with other people who have positional power and tenure, you know, to right. take the hit, right? Totally. You know, so you gotta, you kinda have to learn the system and how to manage it, know, you know, when to lean in and when to hold back and let others lean in. So, you know, the mentorship is important. So, oh, and actually that's a great time for me to do a shameless plug for our program. Um, I'm going to put it in the, um, oh my gosh, did I leave it? No, no, here it is. Um, put it in the chat. Uh, we have not updated it because we only got our score a couple of weeks ago. So we haven't gotten the money yet. And so we're, we're in the process of about to get organized to get the courses moving. So just, you know, go to the website, keep an eye, you know, put a tab on it and, um, you know, look for our promotional emails when it's time to sign up for the workshop. So, and if Congrats. anybody is, thank you. If anybody's going to the LGBT Health Workforce Conference in New York at the end of April, we'll be there and we'll be celebrating. So come by for a little champagne. <laughs> One of the things I, I wanted to do was ask both Ash and, and Juno, just what was it that you had to not include in the talk that, that you wanted to, but there wasn't enough time. I think that that um, such a rich topic. I'm, I'm sure you both had other things that you had to, to kind of make room with. Um, oh, oh no, Ash, 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 you can go first, please. I wanted to say one other quick thing about this bystander conversation we were having, which I don't know how helpful it'll be or not be, but in my experience, um, every situation in which I'm witnessing mistreatment of another person is very different. And in each of those situations, my own personal safety, um, you know, either physical safety or safety in terms of my career is very different. And so the tactics that I use in these different situations vary greatly. Like for example, I remember being at a tumor board where um, there was just like very clear misogyny between attendings that were, that were much more senior than I was. And um, it was from people who were very aggressive in their approach and and we're in leadership. So I, I felt in the moment that the best I could do was just like clear my throat very loudly over and over again. Like just to kind of say like, hey, something's going on here that's not okay. Um, and then to talk about it with the other trainees and then talk about it with my attendings. But I feel like um, 
in my mind, I, I try to be very forgiving of myself and to just do the best that I can in any given situation and to try to do whatever seems possible and safe. And then I think that the other issue about training is that we're so busy that there's very little time to process these things that happen. But I think one thing that I find very helpful is having close colleagues that I can call up and, and just say like, hey, this is what happened today and kind of like talk through, you know, a strategy, a different strategy that I could have used in the moment or a strategy that we could use together now in terms of like, what are we going to do about this faculty member who continues to make fat phobic comments about his patients in clinic or, or whatever it is. Um, and so I just, I guess I wanna also express like a lot of empathy and admiration for all of you for really trying to do this very difficult work. Um, okay, so then in terms of the talk, I, I don't, um, I guess there's two things that come to mind. One is that I work with a community advisory board of transgender people who've been diagnosed with cancer. And we've been working together um, probably for over three years, some of us. And um, last night we were talking about, um, actually Juno and I are working on a chapter for the ASCO book together. And so I brought it to them and we had a conversation about it. And um, it was a very difficult conversation about <clears throat> how we're talking about data collection, in particular, whether we're asking about sex assigned at birth or not. And inadvertently, I um, like I kind of like pushed pushed through instead of like really listening. And it ended up being, I think that one of the community advisory board members felt very um, like kind of bulldozed over and not listened to. And so I guess um, I'm bringing this up because I I think that our work with community members is so important and, and necessary for doing research and also so, so difficult in so many ways. And I think especially with the time constraints of like deadlines, grant deadlines, um, publication deadlines, that it can be really hard to like slow down and try to be a good listener and collaborator. But um, I think that the work with that community advisory board has been like probably some of the most influential of like my career as an oncologist, I mean, such that it is. So I wish that I had had more time to talk about those relationships and that, that work. Um, thanks. Really interesting. And then, I, I mean, I think I always like to give people sort of very practical things. So, you know, usually it's obviously like many talks kind of in some ways um, condensed into one to give ideas, but um, there's, for the folks who are really research minded, I, I really, you know, and or doing research, like to think about things like, you know, example table ones of like, if you're studying uterine cancer, like these are the, you know, the various groups you should think about. And I have like mock table ones and those kinds of things that I think is just very illustrative to see, like most people aren't doing that, but should be, right? So it would be, you know, cisgender women, transgender men, non-binary people, and looking across those different groups to really make visible differences in experience. And then for the clinician colleagues, um, really, you know, how do you ask about pronouns? I mean, how do you um, document them in your chart? How are you um, asking about um, sexual activity and or who's who's supporting you or, you know, um, going through cancer, right? Like these kinds of things so that um, it, it's just very real and granular. And so there's that's kind of the whole next, you know, 201s of like these kinds of talks, but, but you know, the, the hope is at least, you know, planting seeds. Like I didn't, we didn't, none of us learned how to do a history on our patients, you know, in one talk or, you know, learn about cisgender women all in one talk, right? So like same, same type of thing. So, um, but there's obviously a lot more in terms of really taking care of trans and gender diverse people and actually all people <laughs> um, in, a, in a more accurate way. Thank you. So I just can't help noticing that, um, you know, I, I can see the four trainees, Ben, Nick, Julia, and David, and um, are you guys okay? Cause you're not smiling. <laughs> and I just worry, cause this, 
you know, I am new to this area of work. I've only been doing this work for maybe about five something years and it's tough. And um, I just wanted to check in with you. Are you okay? You look pensive. <laughs> There's a lot to think about, right? Like part, I guess part of it is thinking about like the, 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 the multitudes of scales, right? Because a lot of this even assumes that trans folk are getting into the hospital doors in the first instance and like what sort of skews and and even from like a research sort of stats perspective like how do you account for like what is already it can be like a, a smaller subset uh, you're trying to, how do you get the, the most power to answer and most serve people when they're just kind of disserved very broadly and how uh when you have like that the intersections of identity that even further fragment your your ability to resolve things from a very data driven standpoint, which I think the you know institutions of power rely on as like admissions of evidence, whereas like things like ethnographies are a little less admitted as evidence uh, in these spaces. Yeah, very very tough. As a cancer epidemiologist. I think about the numbers all the time. I think about the data all the time. Um, some of the work that I'm doing is about, you know, how do we get more, you know, sexual orientation, gender identity data into our electronic health records? How do I get, I, I'm at MD Anderson. How do I make it happen here? And fortunately, you know, when I have messaged upstairs to leadership, they have been positive and responsive. Um, but it's still slow, slower than is desirable. So fortunately, you know, the time is now and we are moving towards gathering people and beginning to think about how we're going to exert some pressure to really move things forward. And, you know, Barbara and I, we were just on a meeting last week together because I sit on the external um, advisory board for the Yale Cancer Center. And these issues come up. It's actually in the announcement for Cancer Center support grants now. And you know we have to we have to address these issues, and we are we have been slow, but it has to happen. And you're right, the multitude of issues and complexities, and you know just doing it is not just doing it; it's doing it and doing it appropriately and with consideration and respect and inclusion and you know multiple perspectives and involvement. So it's hard. Um, but I, I think, you know, the time is really good because there are a lot of really good people who are in it now and want to make it work well. Uh, the other thing I would say is that the generation that is, I mean, our trainees generation is um, so much more committed to like a good world, right? I mean, you see it in you see it in climate, you see it in, in their response to Black Lives Matter. But um, also, I think um, when it comes to gender and sexual minorities, much more accepting of each other, much more accepting of themselves than certainly, you know, my generation was. So I, I actually, although it is painful work and, and these conversations, um, you know, you remember a lot of things that weren't great. I'm actually more full of hope than I have ever been because I see a new generation coming that's not accepting, you know, not putting up with as much, I would say. I think Ben was going to say something if I missed. Oh, actually, um, maybe I'll just, uh, Dr. Alper, oh. if you don't mind, maybe I'll just bring the conversation to the public forum. Um, so I was going to ask if, um, Dr. Alper and Dr. Ben Malver, if you could expand upon a, a little bit more about um, uh, what's known about sexual and gender minority um, providers, the experiences of the providers, and how, what, what are other interventions that we can do to make sure that we create an open, um, uh, an open kind of workplace environment? Um, because I think a lot of the things that we've been talking about so far has been very patient-centric and also how, um, how we can go about delivering better care, but how about, I, I think that among colleagues and the interactions that we have um, is, is kind of like a unique experience as well, slightly different. Yeah, 
Um, so Ben and I are talking a little bit in the chat about um, a paper that a friend of mine published, basically doing it. He did a survey of trans and gender um, diverse clinicians and just found that people faced face significant barriers during training, including having to hide their identities and witnessing stigma and discrimination. Um, and I was also saying that, you know, I think that I've been talking with various colleagues about building better networks of SGM clinicians across the US so that we can better support each other. Probably not as much as Dr. Obin and Malover, but I have talked to many people who are facing like a lot of really challenging decisions about whether to be out in their personal statements or on the interview trail and how to manage those things. Um, so I don't have like more data to quote you, but I do think that trying to figure out how to better support each other with these decisions would be, would be really helpful. Yeah, I, I think, you know, it's, it's, um, it would be easy to say like, do it, be out and whatever. And that's actually not the real, sadly, people are facing, um, it's, it's a hard situation. People do face discrimination. People are fired. People are, you know, um, lots of the term microaggressions get used. I think there's nothing micro about my uh, persistent microaggressions, right? But, um, you know, even minor things like, you know, department picnics where like, you know, do you, you know, if someone has kids, like, do they bring their partner? Do they not? Do they bring their, you know, kids who are, you know, queer or trans or, you know, like all of these things and yet face face that parental leave, um, you know, all of, all of these things that are not, you know, assumptions. I, I get asked about my husband all the time, you know, like those kinds of things, even in San Francisco, even, you know. So all, all that's to say, um, I think there's, there's a lot of work to do and that we all of us need to be, you know, thinking about our language and our policies. We also, the usual things when we're thinking about diversity of colleagues, right? So recruitment, retention, satisfaction, um, quality of life, equity in terms of pay, retention packages, startup packages, um, space, you know, does the does the uh, the trans researcher get the like little corner office with no window <laughs> and whatever, like versus, you know, the um, and and if that if we're thinking about colleagues, you know, I will say that, uh, you know, we know that there's a minority tax in, especially in academic institutions that um, faculty and providers of color, um, women, LGBTQ plus folks, trans and gender diverse folks um, spend a lot of time, you know, everybody wants a, folks on their committees, everybody wants folks to mentor folks, you know, so, and then that limits productivity, it limits certainly quality of life, sleep, all these other, you know, wellness things. So we have to really be thinking, I think, carefully about this and, and thinking about things like, you know, how much support people are getting. I'm very much for, for example, making visible all of that work, right? So, mm. you know, the, an academic medical center, for example, with its, um, you know, pillars of um, education, training, research, and there's the service component. I think all of those should be visible in terms of um, percent time allocations and, um, and part of promotions and whatnot, and should be effectively monetized and, and considered as part of people's time and percent packages, right? So the fact that I'm on every search committee for a new faculty because people want an LGBT perspective, which is beautiful, but it's also, therefore, I don't get to write the papers and grants as much as my white cisgender male colleagues who are not being asked to be on every single, because there's so many more of them and, you know, so these are the kinds of things that we really need to be asking ourselves as institutions and how our systems are inculcating difference and disparities within them. This has just been a fabulous session on top of your wonderful talk. And um, I think really a, a very meaningful thing for us here at Yale, where I think we don't talk enough about, about um, these topics. And um, I hope we have a chance to engage again in the future and um, wish you both well with your, with your really important work. And thank you again for making time for us. Yes. <laughs> thank you so much. And, and just to say, please, um, any of you individually 
you know, feel free to reach out. Um, our emails are on our slides. We'll make sure that um, that Renee has um, our slides and, and they are accessible to you. Please feel free to tweet. Just speaking um, to Dr. Liu's comment, uh, question about tweeting. Please. Thank you very much, um, of course, and happy, of course, to come back or talk further in other settings. Um, I will just say we are setting up a mentorship network um, for SGM researchers. Um, Ash, I don't even think you know about that. Yeah, it's it's going to mm -hmm. be so we're working on that through Pride Study and Pride Net. We're also going to be setting up a researcher boot camp um, for folks who are interested in SGM research um, to really train on sort of these things. How do you handle multiple gender identities in your metrics and these kinds of things um, for community based researchers as well as academic researchers, um, as well as internship programs um, and postdoctoral programs. So we have summer uh, undergraduate internship programs, we have postdocs, we now are going to have three with the Pride study. So there's various developments to actually train uh, and build the next generation of SGM researchers. So please stay in touch. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye. Bye.